we continue reading in the book of Nehemiah, and we're reading in chapter 6, from 6, 1 to 7, 3. When word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Gesem, and the Arab, and the rest of our enemies, that I had rebuilt the wall, and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me, so I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message, and each time I gave them the same answer. Then the fifth time, Sanballat sent his aid to me with the same message, and in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem says it is true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover... According to these reports, you are about to become their king and have, been appoint, and, had, and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king, so come, let us meet together. I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it up or out of your head. They're all trying to frighten us thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthened my hands. <clears throat> One day I went to the house of Shemaiah, Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabal, who was shut in his home. He said, let us meet in the house of God inside the temple and let us close the temple doors because some people are coming to kill you by night. They are coming to kill you. But I said, should someone like me run away? Or should one like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. I realised that God had not sent him, but that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He had been hired to intimidate me, so that I would commit a sin by doing this, and then they would give me a bad name to discredit me. Remember, Tobiah and Sabalat, my God, because of what they have done. Remember also the prophet Noadiah and how she and the rest of the prophets have been trying to intimidate me. So the war was completed on the 25th of Elu in, 15, in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realised that this work had been done with the help of our God. Also in those days, the nobles of Judah were sending many letters to Tobiah and replies from Tobiah kept coming to them. For many in Judah were under oath to him, since he was son-in-law to Shechaniah, son of Ara, and his son Jehoahan had married the daughter of Meshulam, son of Berechiah. Moreover, they kept reporting to me his deeds and then telling him what I had said. And Tobiah sent letters to intimidate, him, to intimidate me. After the wall had been built and I had sent the doors in place, the gatekeepers, the musicians and the Levites were appointed. I put in charge of Jerusalem my brother Hananiah, along with Hananiah the, the commander of the citadel because he was trustworthy and feared God more than most people do. I said to them, The gates of Jerusalem are not to be opened until the sun is hot. While the gatekeepers are still on duty, have them shut the doors and bar them. Also appoint residents in Jer of Jerusalem as guards, some at their posts and some near their own houses. May God add his blessing to that word. Thank you, Rod. Good morning, everyone. 
I'm still impressed with how well we're doing as Bible readers with some of these names. Um, looking forward to chap- the rest of chapter 7. For those of you who've got your Bibles open and have seen what's coming. Uh, we're actually going to move on to chapter 9 next week. But I want to go over the story so far in, in a moment. However, we mentioned earlier about the Church Vision Day that we had yesterday. And I really appreciated the input of the 25 people who came along and what they shared. It was a really helpful morning and I think that there's a lot that's going to come out of that. Uh, We're going to take the material that we've got and we're going to process it as elders and then we'll get back to you with some of that information and then talk about the next step in the process. But one of the things that came up was that we took some time to think about our local community, our local setting where God had placed us and who we are. And as we did so, one of the things that came up was some of the challenges for people, particularly socioeconomically here in this area. And last week, many of you may have met a gentleman who was coming around the congregation, talking to different people, asking for money. Now, that happens every now and then. And um, he's actually a person that I know very well. And we as a church have helped him out in many different ways. But... Um, On Sunday morning, he was just a little bit more forceful. And so I just want to encourage you, um, when things like that happen, there's two things that you can do. Number one, if you've got the ability to help, then go ahead and help. Um, That's okay. What I would encourage you to do, and it's always up to you, but what I would encourage you to do is to consider if there's any way that you can help them without giving them cash. Because sometimes, um, as last week... Um, it's, it's not always helpful to do so. If you sense that it is the best thing to do at the time, then that's okay. Go ahead and do that. But I want to encourage you that quite often uh, I've been working with these people and what we do as a church is we set aside some vouchers which we have. They're little cards, just like the gift cards that you can buy down at Woolies. And those cards are actually made by Woolworths for charitable organisations so that they can be given to people and used for groceries only. They can't actually be used for alcohol or for cigarettes. And, um, and they're very helpful to hand out, but you've got to go and order them online. You can't just pick them up from the supermarket. So I keep a stash of those. Um, I also will use... Uh, church funds to perhaps buy a ticket for someone if they need to travel somewhere and so on. Now, if you want to take someone to the train station and buy them a ticket, if you want to take them down and give them a coffee, give them something to eat, then that is a really good thing to do. Not only because it helps them with their specific need at the time materially, but it's also a relational thing. You can actually talk to them and you can share a a bit of their life. And if you feel comfortable doing so, then go ahead and do that. That's a good thing to do. But otherwise, I encourage you to um, send them to me so that I can help them in a way which perhaps you can't. There's also lots of other organisations which I try and refer people to, which are going to help them long term, because they're the organisations that will help them to move forward in where they're going. Now, the other thing is that as a church, we need to start thinking about whether this is a call that God has given to us here in this particular community and whether there are ways in which we can be involved more in people's lives. Because, to be honest, there are plenty of organisations, even though they get stretched a lot of the time, but there are organisations that will seek to meet the material and the physical and the psychological needs of people. But God has called us to be involved in those things, but moreover, to be involved in meeting the spiritual needs of people. And there is a way of meeting those spiritual needs in times of crisis which sometimes can't be done in any other way. And so I would encourage us to think a little more about that and pray about that and to see how God would lead us forward in that area. Now, we're going to dive back into Nehemiah's story, but before we do so, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have included us in your story, this story of redemption, a story of changing the world changing people's lives one life at a time so that we get to experience your reign, your rule. And your rule over our lives is so much better than the rule that comes from all the other things that try and exert power over us. 
So help us this morning to see how you would have us live. In Jesus' name, amen. For those of you who need a quick catch up, the book of Nehemiah is about a person, a Jewish person who was living in Persia and he had a very high profile job as cupbearer to the king who tasted his food and wine and made sure he, the king was safe. But when this person named Nehemiah heard that the walls of Jerusalem were broken down and that the people were discouraged and in despair, then he just felt God's spirit moving in him to tell him, go and help those people and so that's what he did and he moved there and he worked with them to help in the work of building the walls and as they built those walls it was a great challenge and they found that they had enemies all around them who were threatening them and so they even had to work at one stage with a weapon in one hand and a tool in the other and they worked day and night in shifts to work this through and we see in this chapter that they finally got the job done they got to the mark at the 52-day mark. And if you like mystery and thriller novels, then you'll enjoy some of the ways in which this book rolls out. Because there's a bit of cloak and dagger here in chapter 6. In chapter 4, there was just blatant hostility before, against Nehemiah and Jerusalem. But now that the walls are up and the more technical work of putting in the gates is yet to be done, Nehemiah's enemies try a different tack. When outright threats and intimidation do not work, maybe a bit of buddying up alongside someone is going to do the job. You know, if you can't beat them up, then sign them up. So that's the kind of approach that these guys are taking. And obviously, these enemies of Jerusalem, Sanballat, um, Geshem, Tobiah, they hope that they can stop the work of Nehemiah by getting him to come on board, to become one of the boys, to join the gang, the local gang of this area. And and how often is this a part of the enemy's strategy to get us to compromise so that we don't end up fulfilling the task which we actually had in front of us? And you'll have heard it in two forms. So the first form, and if you want to fill in the sermon outline this morning, the first thing is that A, they'll try and convince us that ah, what they're asking us to be involved in is not that bad. You know, it's not that bad. I mean, come on, join in. Temptation is there to be more inclusive of the world's attitudes and actions in our lives. Everyone's doing it, they say. Everyone fudges their tax return. Everyone turns a blind eye. Everyone helps themselves. Everyone flirts. Everyone consumes. Everyone gossips. And the list goes on. It's not really that bad. But we know that that's not the New Testament example. Galatians chapter 1, Paul tells us, Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Am I trying to please people? If I was still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. The first temptation is, it's not that bad. But the second compromise that, temptation that comes is this, it's not that important. What you're doing, what you're striving for, what you're keeping your morals high for, it's not really that important. This is not so bad, and this is not so important. There's this temptation to lower our standards, to think that, oh, well, near enough is good enough. To give up on the standard that Jesus has set. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, this is what we hear Jesus say. He says, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And Paul has something to say a bit about this kind of compromise. In Romans 12, too, he says, Don't copy the behaviour and the customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Now, I want to be clear in making sure that you hear this correctly. Because this is not referring to legalistic standards. This is referring to the standard of love. The enemy would love us to be legalistic. Because once we think that we've satisfied a legal measure, then we can think, oh, well, I can just do whatever I like. But love is different. Love doesn't know any boundaries like that. Where legalism stops, love continues. The standard of love is not measured by an amount. It's actually measured by an attitude. And that attitude is one of grace that leads to freedom. 
an attitude of grace that leads to freedom. Ephesians chapter 2, those famous verses, verse 8, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And then Galatians 5, it's for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. You see, when it is love that we say is really important, then it's really hard to argue about that. It's really hard to say to someone, oh, love isn't really that important. If we're talking about a whole lot of legalistic sets of rules, then people can wear you down and you can start to think, oh, maybe it's not that important. But when it is love that is the standard, that is always important. And that is what this project is about for Nehemiah. It's about love. Love for his God and love for his people. For rich and poor. For Nehemiah to leave this task is to say to all of these people and to say to God himself, oh, you're not that important. It's this love expressed in building this wall for the sake of Yahweh, the God of steadfast love, that gives Nehemiah the words to reply to these temptations. He calls this act, which he's involved in, a great project. Nehemiah 6, verse 3 to 4, he says, I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message and each time I gave them the same answer. How helpful it is when we see our discipleship to Jesus as a great project. If we see living the with God life as a great project... If we see part of being team church as an imperative partnership. If we see acting in mercy and grace and love as a vital assignment. If we see our following of Jesus as an essential stage in the changing of the world. If when facing temptation to be greedy, to be indulgent, to be vindictive, to lie, to be dismissive, condescending, lustful, selfish, compromising... We say, instead, I am carrying on a great project and I cannot go down. When facing temptation to give in to fear or anxiety or negativity or pessimism or timidity or depression or doubt, if we would say in our mind, I am carrying on a great project and I cannot, I will not go down. This is the refrain of the servant of Jesus as a participant in seeing God's kingdom come. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. And this is how God sees your life. Ephesians 2.10 We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You have been and are being remade, reshaped into a great project that God will not stop. What are you facing right now that you need to say to, with these words, I'm undergoing a great project. I cannot, I will not go down. I will not back down. Think of what it is that you are facing at this time. Think of the compromise that you are facing. And will you join me in saying these words together that are on the screen? I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Carrying on a great project, you cannot go down. Now, as you can imagine, these words of Nehemiah do not impress Sanballat and all the enemies. So what Sanballat does is he goes to the rumour mill and this time he goes with a new false accusation, verses 5 through 7. Then the fifth time Sanballat sent his assistant to me with the same message and in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written, it is reported among the nations and Geshem says it's true so it's got to be right, 
that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king, so come, let us meet together. There's these rumours which are being put out there. Oh, Nehemiah, we know what you're doing. You're building a wall so that you can revolt against the Persian Empire and call yourself a king. That's what you're doing, isn't it? Notice the report has enough truth in it to make it believable. They are building a wall. But really, it's a fabrication. And it's not clear how much of this story Sanballat is consciously fabricating and how much of it is just coming about because of his own fears and concerns. Because this is what happens when human beings mistrust each other. It's what is often called a straw man fallacy. This is when we refute a position which our opposition, our our opponent, never actually took but which we think they have taken or that we want them to take so that we can oppose them and knock them down. We describe a position in terms we find easy to be offended by and then we have a go at it. I've done it, you've done it in small ways and maybe in big ways. People do this all the time. In fact, one of the classics is this. All Muslims are terrorists and want to implement Sharia law. Now, what that does is it makes it very easy to then oppose all Muslims. This is actually wrong, by the way. A report here in Australia, according to the Christian journal St. Mark's Review, put out by Charles Sturt University, says that that's not in any way true of most Muslims. But it is, however, a characterisation that makes it easier to justify and dislike people of Muslim background. Let's be clear. It is sometimes what we fear, it is sometimes what we imagine is going on that we oppose and not what is actually going on. Because frankly, we haven't taken the time to accurately understand. And some internet sites, some emails, some personalities may not be as well informed as we thought they were. Moreover, this is not how Jesus approached people. Jesus did not stereotype people. Jesus accepted them individually. Whether it was a Samaritan or a Roman centurion, whether it was a Syrian or an adulteress or a Roman collaborator or a religious zealot or a religious conservative. But instead, Jesus gives this teaching in Matthew chapter 7. He says, In everything do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. So Nehemiah's story should pull us up straight away. He is being unfairly accused. He's being falsely misrepresented. And a part of our response to this story should not be simply to think of how we're being treated, but to think of how we are treating others. How are we treating others? Jesus tells us to check our own attitude. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. He says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way as you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will be able to see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. It's interesting, I was just listening just two weeks ago to a Christian podcaster talking about how she went and visited her old pastor down in the deep south of the USA. And once she'd finished her visit with him, she said, okay, I need to go back to the the airport. And when he heard that she was going to get an Uber back to the airport, he said, oh, no, you can't do that. I've got a Muslim neighbour next door who loves to drive people around. He'll do it for you. And so he called him up and he came by and he took her to the airport. And she was reflecting in her podcast about how this... Uh, conversation that she had in the car was a really positive conversation where he was asking all sorts of things about her, was really interested to know her beliefs 
and was really keen on sharing how there were so many things that they had in common. And she was really pleasantly surprised with how much of a great conversation she had with him and how different it was to the ways that she used to think about people when she was raised in the Deep South. And she reflected on this verse, Matthew 7, verse 2. For in the same way as you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. If we, as Christians, want to be given a fair chance to talk about what we believe without being typecast as some kind of harsh, judgmental Christian then we need to make sure that we begin by not typecasting other people. If we want to be given a fair go in serving our community, we need to give our community a fair go in serving them. Because this suspicion and mistrust between people is a growing problem in our world today. There is racist profiling, there is social profiling, there is religious profiling which is rife. People are going to profile us as Christians in particular ways. It happened in Nehemiah's time. Chapter 6, verse 6 says, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem says it's true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building the wall. It happened in Jesus' time. Matthew 11, verse 18 to 19. John the Baptist didn't spend his time eating and drinking, Jesus says, and yet you say he's possessed by a demon. And the Son of Man, that's Jesus, on the other hand, feasts and drinks. And you say, he's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and other sinners. But wisdom is shown to be right by its results. It happened in the time of the early church. One Roman writer states that the followers of Crestus, in other words, the followers of Christ, were cannibals and they were incestuous. Can you understand how that came about? They were cannibals because they ate the flesh of Christ. They used to have these feasts, they called them love feasts, where they would eat the body and the blood, which of course is symbolic, the the, um, bread and the wine representing Jesus. And then word got out that they were incestuous because they had this love for brother and sister. It was a bit weird, this brother and sister love. False accusations are thrown around all the time. And sometimes there is nothing we can do about those accusations. They are just going to be made. Except we can do what Nehemiah did, which was press on regardless. Chapter 6, verse 9 and verse 15 and 16. He says, They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed, Now strengthen my hands. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul, In 52 days, when all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. But I want you to notice something else. He doesn't just continue on with the work. He does something else. He sets the record straight. Chapter 6, verse 8 says this. I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you were saying is happening. You're just making it up out of your head. That's a pretty good reply, I think. And that's what I want to explore before we close, just briefly. I think we need to ask ourselves two questions. The first one is this. Are we aware of how people perceive us today? Are we actually aware of how people perceive us today? About how people perceive us as the church and how people perceive us as the local church, Ingleburn Baptist, and how people perceive us as followers of Jesus. What message are we sending people? Do we convey that we think we are better than others and that they are meant to become one of us? Is that what we're conveying? Part of the problem is that the church can be perceived by some to be on a, a mission of world domination. And why? Well, because churches have actually tried to do that in the past. The association that the church had with colonialism in the 1800s did not help, where they mixed cultural values with kingdom values. Here in Australia, instead of 
engaging with Indigenous peoples at a level where we talked with them about their fascinating theology of a creator and a created world. Instead, we just tried to turn them into Victorian English ladies and gentlemen in some places. Anne and I had a friend who hated missionaries. She hated missionaries because she thought that they were out just to steal people from their families. They went into villages just to make people into little white people. And now, she said, they were doing it in the suburbs. The fascinating thing was we were having a conversation about that while she was having a cup of coffee with us at our house on Morling College Theological Campus. And our hope was that she would change that perception a little bit. So we must ask, what impression are we giving people today? Do we give people the impression that we disapprove of them? That, we are on, that people are only welcome in church once they have cleaned themselves up and got themselves sorted out? Do we give the impression that we want to control people and their behaviour? In the church where we were in, in England, Anne and I had to work very hard to give the impression that the church was not existing to take from the community, it existed to give to the community. Because what had happened is that the, that little local church in this village was so used to asking people from the community to come to events, to fundraise for the church, that everyone thought of the church as something that the village supported instead of the church being something that supported the village. That was the way that people saw it. But that's not how it's meant to be. For too long, Christians have been perceived to be those who take from this world rather than give to it. We've been seen as those who seek power rather than those who submit to a greater power and seek to empower others by turning the other cheek, by giving our cloak, by carrying the load another mile, by feeding our enemy, giving people pause to see the world in a different light. When Jesus came, do you remember the impression that people had of him? Do you remember the impression that people had of Jesus? There were some people that were really unimpressed with Jesus, weren't they? There were the religious who were unimpressed with Jesus. But the average person, what was their perception of Jesus? They loved him. They absolutely loved him. The so-called sinners responded by welcoming him and flocking to listen to him. These people out there in our community are not our enemies. These are the people that we once were. These are the people that when presented with Jesus have a very different reaction to what we think. Most of them would be really happy to actually have us in their world, to have us be willing to sit and listen to them, to not judge them to really care about them, to be their supporters and their encouragers as they work through some really hard things which have come, some from their own choices, but a lot from the choices of other people and just the position they find themselves inheriting in life. In fact, when we show people love, people start to realise that they actually have nothing to lose by having us in their life. Remember Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 3? He says, I am carrying on a great project. This is our great project, to bless the world to the glory of God, demonstrating a wide-reaching community of peace and joy and love and hope for all kinds of people, and enabling people to actually become disciples who experience the same kind of life that Jesus had. Giving the impression to the world that every one of us can know significance and security and acceptance through a relationship with Jesus, that is our great project. And so I want to ask you the second question and leave you with it. Are we willing to be the people that we perceive ourselves to be? Are we willing to be the people we perceive ourselves to be? I imagine that you perceive yourself to be, as a follower of Jesus, someone who is a lover of people, 
a lover of the world that he has told us to go and reach. The question for us is, are we actually willing to be the people that we perceive ourselves to be? The people that Jesus instructed us to be in Matthew 5, 6 and 7. In Romans chapter 12, where Paul tells us what church is like. Of 1 Corinthians 13, where love is articulated in its myriad of forms. Are we willing to be the people that we want to give the impression of being? The only way we're going to genuinely give that impression, that we are here to give to people's lives and not to get, is to actually be becoming that kind of person. Nehemiah said to the people, will you build? Jesus calls to us now and he says, will you follow me? Are we willing to be the people we perceive ourselves to be? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we look at you and we recognize that the impression that you gave people about God was that he loved them that he cared about them, that he accepted and welcomed them, that he could deal with their sin, that he could change the life that they had and that it would be a really wonderful change because it would be a change just like the impression of life that Jesus gave. God, we recognise that our world will seek to get us to compromise. It will get us to think, ah, some of the things that the world engages in that are contrary to what Jesus lived out are actually not that bad. But God, we recognise, as we see in Jesus, that he was not willing to touch those things. We also know that this world is going to tell us that this task of following Jesus is not that important. It's actually to follow after our own desires. That's the important thing. It's not really that important to give ourselves wholeheartedly to God. Just half-heartedly will be fine. And it's not really important to actively engage with God. Just passively will be fine. Lord, there are so many compromises out there. But how can we compromise when we see you? When we taste how good you are, why would we go to anything else? When we discover living water, why would we turn to something else? When we find the bread of life, why would we eat anything else? When we discover a God who transforms everything every day, then why would we seek to conform to the things of this world? Lord, we know that we would seek to do those things because as human beings, we're messed up and we need your help. And that is why you have given us your Holy Spirit. So Lord, help us to remember that there is strength available, that there is power and energy, that there is enthusiasm, that there is the kind of love that Jesus showed available to us right now through the Holy Spirit. So, Father, those of us who would dare do so, pray right now, Holy Spirit, fill me once again. Make me into the kind of person that gives the impression of you which is accurate, that lets the world know that there is a Jesus and he is alive and well in me. Lord, as a church, we would dare to pray that you would transform us, that you would change us into your likeness and you would enable us, contrary to the perception that society has, to give an impression of your loving, accepting joy in welcoming people into your kingdom, that the door of the kingdom is wide open, And that if we've been able to come in, then any one of them are able to come in too. That you give us the ability to repent and turn from the ways that destroy us and live a life which builds us up. 
You are the true source of greatness and goodness and love. And we turn to you this day. Lord, transform us for your sake. In Jesus' name, amen.